Well, welcome uh, to session four. I'm so glad you came back. Uh, you know, that's always a risk, right? <laughs> we get people here and then they don't come back. So I uh, commend you for your Lenten penance, at least, and for your perseverance in this uh, beautiful program. We have been hearing uh, a lot of feedback from um, many of you, and I appreciate, again, uh, your willing to sh uh, share some of your time uh, with us. We are on to the fourth. Can you imagine? Four out of five. We're uh, getting close, and we are moving to the second step, as you uh, will remember, in the spiritual journey. Uh, more than steps, we're seeing these as stages. More than stages, we're seeing these as aspects of our spiritual journey. So it is kind of like a uh, weather systems that uh, breeze through uh, our lives as we journey on. So uh, I invite you to, uh, why don't you stand and let's uh, join in our opening prayer. Oh, I don't know why that happened. We just have to do it from memory. My knees to the Father of Jesus, the Lord who has shown us the glory of God. May He in His love give us strength for our living, the strength of the Spirit, the glory of God. May Christ find a dwelling place of faith in our hearts. May our lives be pray together. O oh God, who teach us that you abide in the hearts of just and true, grant that we may be so fashioned by your grace as to become a dwelling pleasing to you. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, as you may or may not know, in the Holy Mass, there is always a preface uh, preceding uh, the actual uh, Eucharistic prayer. And for Lent, there are four such prefaces, so the presider can choose uh, which preface he would like to pray. Uh, this is preface number two of Lent, and I thought that it was, I thought of all of you when I... Uh, prayed this uh, this morning at Mass, as a matter of fact. Uh, for you have given your children a sacred time for renewing and purifying of their hearts that freed from disordered affections, the purgative stage, right? Freed from disordered affections, they may so deal with the things of this passing world 
as to hold rather to the things that eternally endure. Okay, sisters and brothers. Uh, you know that we are celebrating scrutinies with those to be baptized. Last weekend, if you uh, celebrate the 1130 Mass, uh, we had the rite of scrutiny. We celebrated the uh, woman at the well. And uh, on the second scrutiny, we celebrate the man born blind from John's Gospel. And uh, so let's take a look at that. When Jesus heard that they had thrown the man out of the synagogue, he found him and said, do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered and said, Well, who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have seen him. The one speaking with you is he. He said, I do believe, Lord. And he worshipped him. Then Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see might see. And those who do see might become blind. Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not also blind, are we? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you are saying, We see. So your sin remains. Let's uh, pray that the Lord would give all of us uh, sight. Sight. I want to remind you uh, that the goal of our study is, uh, I'm trimming it down every week, but all the faithful of Christ must follow in Christ's footsteps. You know, I've been taken up with the silly walking and uh, the way that our walking, devoting themselves to, uh, with all their being to the glory of God and the service of their neighbor. Um, Therefore, I have uh, come up with, it is the chosen, ever adapting, and obvious style or manner of walking the journey of faith. Right? Just let's look at those. It is the chosen, so we have to elect our spirituality. It is the ever adapting, so we are constantly, if we're living it, we are constantly adapting the way in which we are walking, so the manner of our walking. And it's the obvious style, meaning other people can see it. So that's the whole point of Catholic spirituality, is that it is a manifestation in our lives. It's the reshaping, as the opening prayer said, it's the fashioning of our lives into uh, a reflection of and into the modeling and following of Christ in his footsteps, in his walking, the journey of daily life, which reflects one's relationship with God. So the question for all of us, if we're going to examine our conscience to go to confession or we're going to examine our uh, daily life in the daily examine, which uh, Father Joshua is going to share with us about this evening, uh, we can always question ourselves on this process. Am I walking in my daily life in a manner and in a style that reflects the fact that I have encountered the living God? And I have allowed myself to be, uh, remember, rearranged. Bishop Barron says that uh, this is what it means to be converted, is that objective reality, God, is rearranging our lives. And therefore, like J uh, Jacob, you know, Israel, we walk differently. We walk in with a limp, uh, which gives evidence to the struggle and the wrestling with God that we have. So, this is important. And we said there are three stages, three steps, if you will, on the spiritual life traditionally, the uh, purgative, the illuminative, and the unitive. And so I just want to remind you that this is, the, and I said that these are more like weather systems. So we're on the journey of life. We're on the journey of following uh, the way of God and walking in the way of Christ. And uh, uh, storms come and breezes and sunshine and rain and Pleasantness. And so uh, it continuously. So it's not like we uh, go through the purgative stage and like, oh, that's great. Do you ever go from uh, Cleveland to like California and you get through Kansas and Iowa? You say, oh, thank God that's over. You know, don't want to do that again. Have you been there? No, you don't want to do it. 
uh, when I was 10 years old, my parents took us to California in a car with a travel trailer in the back. And uh, uh, believe me, Iowa and Kansas are not something you want to experience again <laughs> from the back seat of a station wagon. So, uh, but these uh, stages and phases, these are uh, maybe uh, the, the modes of our walking, and they are reoccurring. And so uh, we don't want to be misunderstanding this. And so we have the purgative stage is the uh, separating ourselves and conquering the fundamental temptations of the flesh, our attachment to sin, that disordered attachment or disordered desires that come up out of our instinctual the uh, um, lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the uh, pride of life. So all of those things are temptations in which we can be led to sin. So we, be, we develop, in fact, a disordered attachment to the fulfillment of those desires. So without Christ and without salvation, without sanctifying grace, without the grace of the sacraments, teaching the church, life in the community, we can uh, persist in feeding the monster that we have created by our uh, willingly, if you will, giving into these uh, uh, desires or passions in life. So the purgative stage was the uh, conquering, if you will, taming our attachment, especially to mortal sin, to serious sin in our lives. The second stage is what we call the illuminative. It is the pro, uh, people that are proficient. It is rather than separating ourselves from the temptation of sin, it is a growing in our habitual attachment to virtue. And so that's what we're going to talk. So last week we talked about the purgative way or the purgative uh, mode of walking in the spiritual life. And tonight we're going to talk a little bit about the illuminative way. And then, of course, the third way is this we call the unitive way. It is for the so-called perfect, and it is the habitual attachment to resting in God, to the uh, habitual company of God in our daily lives, our thoughts, our feelings, our desires, our prayers, etc. So uh, let's just... Go And remember, I said that they are not steps that we go through and we don't go back. It is more of a spiral, spiral staircase going around. And so we keep going through uh, these experiences in our spiritual lives. So I don't want anybody who is for a year now, they have been, oh, just great. I have no problem with sin. Everything's hunky-dory. You know, I'm through Iowa and Kansas. Don't have to worry about this anymore. And all of a sudden, we come around a corner and boom. We get reminded of and we fall uh, victim to, if you will, uh, those, uh, those old desires and sins and attachments and uh, illusions and delusions, you know, our passions. So all of a sudden we just become enraged with somebody or something. And we don't, we can't figure out where, what is this about? I, I thought I was over that. Or how about grief? You know, those of you that are, are maybe still actively grieving, but all of us who have grief in our life, you know, you're thinking, you know, I'm fine. And all of a sudden, you walk in and, I don't know, a breeze hits you in the face and boom. So it's a bit of a setback. And so rather than be discouraged, we have to anticipate such things. What I was uh, noticing that as we as Catholics, we have an extra advantage in all of this is because every time we come into the Holy Mass, we are reminded of this pattern of our spiritual journey and these features of our spiritual journey. So, you know, the Pope goes to say Mass, and I know he identifies himself as a sinner, but I mean, you know, I think, well, the Pope's the Pope. You know, I hope he's not too serious of a sinner. I hope he's got it going on. But based on what I'm saying, I'm presuming, obviously he has sin all the time. So he begins, like you and me, every day when, uh, by saying, let's prepare our hearts so we might more worthily celebrate these holy mysteries by calling to mind our sins. So the purgative penitential act so you see in the whole movement of the Mass, we are just working through the purgative rite of the Mass, the penitential rite, and then the illuminative is the enlightenment of the mind and the heart by the proclamation of God's Word, communion with God's Word. So in the proclamation of the Scriptures, the homily, 
And even in the intercessions, we can see ourselves being enlightened and lifted up, clarified, brightened, encouraged, strengthened by the word of God. So that would be uh, unto the illuminative uh, aspect of our spiritual lives. And then uh, thirdly, we all get up and we uh, get in procession. So we're not in line to receive Holy Communion, right? I've, I've said this oftentimes. You know, if I did a man on the street thing, you're all in the, in the communion. Person. Hi, what are you doing? Well, I'm waiting in line to get communion. That's what, <laughs> matter of fact, that's what most of us would say. So if I was down at the cathedral, you know, going mass, and they said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm waiting in line to go get communion. But that's not my best thought. My best thought is that, no, I am among the people of God, the pilgrim people of God, in communion of mind, heart, and faith, and we are processing onto the uh, journey of communion with our God who has come to save us and who feeds us like bread from heaven and heals us. That's what I'm doing. Oh, so unitive. So the communion rite, sister and brothers, as Catholics, so we don't ever want to go to Mass the same way again now that you've been here. Uh, you are... We are going to recognize that we are, kind of remember the game when your kid duck, duck, goose, duck, duck, goose? Uh, in the Holy Mass, we are duck, 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 uh, all three aspects of our lives as uh, spiritual seekers, spiritual journeyers. We call this in the Bible language, sojourners, sojourners, those who are on the way. Um, okay. What I wanted to remember to tell you last week, and I didn't, so I'm taking some time this week, is that this uh, uh, taming of the uh, temptations of the, uh, of the flesh particularly, but our attachment to sin and our disordered attachment to sin, what is the task of the, uh, um, the purgative stage of life? Um, we have got to recognize... Uh, how we are going to do that. And so what, I know this sounds like a disaster, like, oh my gosh, I have to tame, I have to break my attachment to sin. Well, yeah, thanks, Father, that's encouraging. We know that, you know, that's been, uh, that's been obvious to us forever. So uh, what I want you to uh, be aware of is that the capital sins, and you will see these on that piece of paper that I handed out to you at the door of the church, at the door of the uh, uh, the gathering this evening. The church has forever identified for us what we call the capital sins. Uh, they're typically and traditionally seven capital sins, and you see them on your paper. And I decided that, well, maybe people don't know what is uh, the sin of gluttony, or what is the sin of sloth, or what is the sin of envy, etc., avarice, greed, sorrow. You know, I had to... Uh, I had to look up sorrow myself uh, because I was thinking, well, it's not a sin to be sad. Well, that's not what sorrow is about. But the bottom line is, is that now you have a list there of what we mean by uh, some examples of these capital sins. So, if you are, so I'm thinking we can work this thing backwards. If you are still suffering from uh, the failure to separate yourself from uh, the attachment to sin, what you can identify is, well, what is that sin? And what category of uh, st uh, the stage of the spiritual life might I be uh, sinning in? So if you're here in gluttony, lust, and sloth, that's my favorite place. Oh, I'm, you know, I'm the only one, I see, okay. So if you're hanging out here in gluttony, lust, and sloth, uh, you might say, well, how, how, where might this be leading me? Say, well, that is the lust of the flesh. It is something about pleasure. I'm disoriented or I am uh, overly attached to satisfying uh, the senses of pleasure, the demands and desires of pleasure in my body. And so you say, okay, that's fine. And this really has to do with my relationship to myself. And why am I pampering myself? Why can't I take a little uh, self-denial, a little discipline, a little self-mastery, as they call in the church? Well, uh, we can see that we are 
dealing with the purgative, oh, excuse me, uh, the purgative stage of our spiritual journey. And as we know from the other um, many charts, you have that long, uh, big long chart that there are, and we're going to find out tonight, there are actually virtues that you could practice that are going to go along with this stage of the spiritual life. So our sins can be our guidepost and our help. I know you think they're just a disaster, that it's always just a disaster because I have a sin. And I said, well, let's not waste a good sin, right? As long as we got it, and as long as we're confessing it and repenting of it, why don't we just say, you know, now, I don't know about you, Father, same thing, I, uh, bless me, Father, if I have sinned, my last confession was three months ago. And, well, it's pretty much the same thing it was three months ago. Oh, you, never, you guys never have that. I guess none of you have been in my confessional. So, uh, yeah. So it's the same as it was three months ago. Same old, same old, same sins all the time. I said, really? Well, you know, now, if you got me, I might say, well, why is that? And you go, what? <laughs> I said, why is that, do you think? I don't know. So I can see you're irritated that I've asked you. Well, why is that? I don't know. Well, what this little chart and these, uh, this list of sins and this uh, plan for moving through, we might say, well, you know what? That sin is trying to tell you something. You know, if you are uh, gossiping, uh, down here we'll move to uh, envy, I'm presuming. Uh, if you're gossiping, and that's, you just can't control yourself, well, you might say, well, this is really uh, a complication of my taking the place of God in the world. Because, you know, in order to gossip about something, you have to judge them, right? And so maybe uh, what I need to do is to think about where is my desire for gossip uh, coming from? And why is it that I, you know, little Eddie Estock here, has this compulsion to gossip about other people? Well, maybe... Uh, Maybe you haven't uh, felt so great about yourself. You know? We really don't choose to do anything, brothers and sisters, that we don't perceive in that moment to be good. That's the way we're built. You cannot choose. So that's what it means takes to, to make a sin, right? You've got to freely choose to do something truly evil in order for it to be a sin. So we will not choose to do something if we have not decided that that something is a good. We've concluded that it would be good for me to gossip about my neighbor. <laughs> there's something in it for me. So there, there's something good I'm going after in the sin. So that's what I'm saying. So this chart of the sins, the, and then your list of the specifics about these seven capital sins, could lead you to uh, what aspect of your life with God that uh, needs to be adjusted. And what we're going to see in the illuminative way is the church, in her wisdom, has provided us uh, directions. So well, now that you've identified this sin, and now that you see what it is, which temptation are you falling victim to, and uh, what would the church possibly recommend for you to counteract that uh that sin. So, um, and that's what we're going to talk about in the illuminative stage. So I w just wanted to finish off that the purgative stage is really our taming the temptations and our uh, attachment uh, to sin. And so we can see that even many years into the spiritual life, we are on occasion going to have to deal with a sinful choice that we've made, and we have to deal with the grief of that, we have to confess it, we have to repent of it, and it's not good enough just to say, oh, terrible me, see? I thought I was better, but I'm not. I'm still, you know, I'm going to eat a worm. That's just where we're left. Not the case. Not the case. Not for the children of God. The children of God say, well, I'm good, and the reason I was doing good, that's what other people say to me, bless me, Father, for I have sinned last confession three months ago. Well, actually, I've been pretty good. I said, well, 
let me just clarify something here. You know, God made you good. You really don't get any credit for good. You know what I mean? Right? So you're, you're always good. And what a tragedy for you to think because you sin, you're not good. That's not a Catholic thought. That's not a Catholic thought. So, uh, so when we sin, even after making much, pro, being proficient, or even maybe enjoying the, the restful companionship of God in our, uh, maybe our prayerful and our charitable uh, life in the world, we are going to run into, uh, you know, the serpent in the garden. And we are going to, on occasion, sin. But we cannot lose hope, we cannot lose faith, and we certainly cannot lose charity because of it. What we have to do is we have to remember, obviously, God's mercy, but we have to say, hmm, Lord, what might, how might I grow through this? That's the point, because God is not done with any of us, ever. None of us. So, uh, so let that be an encouragement to you and to me that we as Catholics and Christians, we are not you know, backsliders. We are not afraid of, well, yeah, we would like not to backslide, but the fact is, is that we all do. And the day that we think that we don't have to worry about the purgative stage, we don't have to worry about our attachment to sin, and they, uh, guess what? That's another sin. Yeah, it's another sin. So, you know, to presume perfection on yourself and not needing the grace of God, not greeting, needing the mercy of God, thank God I'm not like other people. I don't have to remind you about that Pharisee standing in the back of the, uh, in the front of the temple, right? Thank God I'm not like other people. Can you imagine he uttered such a prayer? No, I can't imagine uttering that prayer. So, uh, we're going to move on to the illuminative stage now, uh, friends, and this is uh, the second second step, if you will, on uh, the journey. And I have up here a little scripture encouragement from Father Joshua. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So, sisters and brothers, moving from the lust of the flesh and our instinctual drives for self-satisfaction and uh, fulfillment of our pleasures... The illuminative stage is encouraging us to come forward into the light. So out of the darkness of our self-reflection and, the, um, you know, Lazarus all wrapped up in the bonds of sin and the stench of death and the darkness of the cave, to come out of that uh, purgation and that uh, cleansing and, and to come into the light. And this is the move from the self and the flesh to the mind and the word and the light. That's why it's called the illuminative stage. And so uh, this is, uh, St. Paul is great on this. St. John's gospel is great on this. Um, but uh, so this is the letter to the Romans. So let's consider the illuminative way. What is it that I might see in the light of God's grace, in the light of God's spirit, that I might uh, be united, more closely united, with the God who is the light of the world? All right? So, uh, so the, the stage of the illuminative stage, so the task of the illuminative stage is... Uh, to apply our energies chiefly to advance in virtue. So like the man born blind and the conversation of Jesus with the Pharisees, right? are you saying we're blind? He said, no, I came into this world that those who could not see might see and those who see might be blind. So that this is a special type of seeing. As a matter of fact, I have always been, you've heard the sign that seeing is believing. No. Not in the Catholic spiritual life. Believing is a way of seeing. A way of seeing. And so the gift of faith that Jesus has come to bring all of us uh, and he has given to this uh, blind man uh, is uh, to advance in virtue so that I might see the, the good and the holy and the true and see that it is not just an example for me out there, but it is a power. Sister and brothers, the word virtues, virtue comes from virtus, and virtus is really power. 
the strength. So what we believe, and you have a list of the moral virtues on your table, is that in the spiritual life, God doesn't expect, he doesn't set up here, okay, these are the disciplines, folks. You know, it's like when you go to the Y and the gym says, the coach says, okay, you know, this is what you're going to have to do. We're going to have to run a half a mile. Then we're going to have to do jumping jacks. We're going to have to do this. We're going to have to do that and the other thing. But nobody lifts a finger to help you do it. They just keep yelling at you. Yeah, come on, pick it up, you know, slow boat. Come on, let's go. So, you know, so that is one person's way of saying. So God stands back there and says, all right, here you go, folks. I've given you the directions. I've given you, you know, I've given you an idea where this is going. Uh, but no fuel for the car, you know. That would be pretty cool. Remember Pharaoh? He made them double the number of bricks and he stopped providing them straw. That's really cruel. To put demands on you and then not provide you with the assistance, with what's necessary to make the journey. A virtue is the grace of God. It is a gift of God that you might accomplish that virtue in your life. So, you know, they say that God will never call you to anything that he doesn't provide you the grace to accomplish. That would be cruel. So all of you uh, married people who can't, <laughs> can't believe that God expected you to be uh, happy and faithful with each other for all these years, he would never have called you to it without giving you the grace of the sacrament of matrimony. It's all in there. It's like that prego spaghetti sauce. Okay. So, uh, so this advance in the virtues belongs to those who are making progress and who are principally concerned that charity may be increased and strengthened in them. Okay? So uh, let me tell you about the illuminative, if you will, phase of the history of Catholic spirituality. So if you want to pull out your timeline, you might find it helpful. I have a, a much clearer picture, by the way. Father Joshua, again, is helping me in my uh, technological uh, advances. Um, so you see in the first uh, 1,000 years on that side of the, uh, uh, of the uh, timeline, that we are moving into the early Middle Ages. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, I want you to see on there that beginning in the 6th century, so the number 500 and forward, you see the Benedictine establishment of the Benedictine monasteries, right? And so this was a movement from out of the hermits and the desert into the monastery, into the enclosure. And it was Benedict's uh, uh, desire in uh, that phase of our spiritual development in the dark ages, if you will, uh, to uh, bring the word of God and meditation upon the word of God and uh, the uh, communal love in the monastery and uh, the worship of God. So it is in the meditation upon the word of God, Lectio Divina. It is in the work and labor in the community and it is in the worship of God in, uh, in the liturgy. Those were the ways in which they were calling people to move into what we would say is a, a virtuous and a charitable uh, communion of the faithful and occupied with the things of God, the word of God, and the, uh, the virtues, the practice of the virtues. So that uh, for thousand years, to be honest with you. The monastic model of our Christian spirituality was dominant. They even elected a monk to become Pope. Gregory the Great was a monk who became Pope, and he began to spread this uh, monastic notion and spirituality uh, throughout uh, the world, the Christian world. If you want to flip the paper over, uh, you can see that inside Benedictinism, uh, we had uh, the, uh, the Cistercians and the Camaldolees and the, uh, what's the other? Oh, Carthusians. These were all uh, variations on Benedictine monasticism. So in the year 1000 and 1100, you see those movements uh, here in the blue. Uh, text on the, the, uh, the timeline. So what's important about that is that for all these years, this notion of communing with God in the enclosure 
of the monastery and in reflection upon God's word and meditation and uh, the exercise of uh, charity. They call the monastery the school of charity. You know, a lot of times I think we can get confused between uh, holiness. Remember I said a lot of people think holiness means sinlessness. So how could I, a sinner, be holy? Well, that's not true. So we got that one knocked down. Now the fact is that uh, we have oftentimes confused or dissociated holiness with love, charity. So that all the great saints and all the heroes of our Christian, uh, our Catholic spirituality have encouraged us to uh, grow in the virtue of charity. So that's the greatest virtue. That's the destination of all of our lives. And that is the purpose of a spiritual life. Is to, and you might say, well, I thought it was to become, you know, friend of God. Well, and you know what John has told us in his first letter? That God is love. Right? So communion with God is communion with love itself. And so, uh, so this is, uh, as you will see on your timeline, in the 13th century, uh, the mendicants came about. And so Francis and Dominic and the Carmelites and all those people that are really the most famous uh, people in Catholic spirituality. You know, there are more people dedicated to St. Francis in the Catholic world. So I mean, priests, nuns, brothers, third order people. Yeah. There are more people dedicated to St. Francis than anybody else in the Christian history, except, of course, for the Blessed Virgin Mary. So uh, Franciscanism and uh, this mendicantism is uh, very, very popular. Well, we're not going to talk about that tonight. We're going to jump to uh, St. Ignatius in the 16th century, way over here in the Spanish Catholic uh, period, uh, because he, uh, like St. Benedict, who the rule of St. Benedict, written in the 6th century, was the most influential uh, religious uh, document in the history of uh, Catholicism, Christ, uh, Christianity. It dominated for a thousand years, as I've been saying. That was, of course, until St. Ignatius of Loyola came along. And St. Ignatius of Loyola implemented a revolution in our Catholic spirituality. And his, um, his revolution came out of the blending between this Benedictine monastery and these Franciscans' uh, service in the world to the poor. So the Franciscans came out of the monasteries and they started serving the poor in the cities. And so that was a challenge between these two ways of Benedictine monasticism, enclosed prayer, work, meditation upon God's word, illuminating our lives, and this Franciscan call to serve the poor and to move out into the cities and to take uh, the faith and the spirituality into the streets. Right. So, of course, these people were debating all the time. Along comes St. Ignatius of Loyola, and he comes up with the Ignatian Revolution, and it puts uh, spirituality and prayer and action together. And so he is uh, famous for reminding us that uh, to know God's will is perfect. Huh? And to do God's will is the more perfect. Yeah. So the monks in the monastery might have had the fact that to know God's will you know, to, is to hold God in your heart, to have God in your mind, to be illuminated with God's will. Uh, St. Ignatius says, yeah, that's just step one. Then you have to do God's will in the world and uh, make it perfect. Let's just, uh, so I've gone through that already. Uh, in the monastic life, I mentioned that. These are some facts about St. Benedict. You know we have a Benedictine monastery right here in Cleveland, right? They run Benedictine High School. They serve at uh, Assumption Parish. And they are, for the most part, I go there for retreat, etc. They are, most part, living this life in pretty much the same way that uh, St. Uh, Benedict did. They uh, wear a Benedictine habit. It's black, 
uh, uh, front and back, and they have a cow, black cow. They live in community. They each the monks has a cell. They practice. They get together to pray four times, five times a day, in the monastery uh, abbey chapel. And uh, these monks here, they have a work in the world, which monks always do, ora et labora, so pray and work. That was Benedict's uh, uh, saying. Um, and so uh, they teach school. Now, some of them also do parish ministry. But pretty much they are living the uh, same as the monks 1,500 years ago. Uh, and Benedict was an Italian, and he ended up going up to uh, a Mons, uh, what is it, Montserrat. I get uh, he and uh, Ignatius confused. Uh, anyway, is it there? Yes, that was the town where he uh, went out and sat in the mountain and for three years <laughs> and lived inside a monastery. Just like, remember, Anthony, he went out and lived in that old fort for six years. Uh, Benedict did the same thing up on the mountain, and uh, then he came out and he set up uh, 12 monasteries around him, and each a monastery had 12 monks in it. So his method was to chant the divine office, which we are going to do tonight. The divine office is the liturgy of the hours, right? So to chant the divine office and meditative reading of the scriptures, which is Lectio Divina, an accomplishment, the perfection of life by these formal periods of prayer carried on, as I said, in the enclosure away from the world. So, uh, you know, he came up with the 12 steps of humility, which is a reminder of this pathway to illumination, which is the practice of the virtues. So let's uh, move on. But he had 12 steps, can you imagine? 12 steps of humility, 12 degrees of humility. And I read through them again when I was putting this slide together, and uh, it's not complicated, that's for sure. But you may be struggling at work to accomplish this. That's where this would usually get you, right? How about uh, be ob obedient to God in my superiors? When was the last time you turned around from the, the boss and grumbled all the way back to or whatever the job he had given you to do. Uh, be happy not only saying, but sincerely believing that you are the lowliest of people. How's that going to go over today? Yeah, not too great. <laughs> do not speak unless asked to speak. Boy, I'm in trouble. <laughs> be not easily moved or brought to laughter. Yeah. Yeah, I think laughter is healing, but I'm going to leave it. He's a saint. I'm not. Speak gently without laughter and with few words. Uh, somebody gave me a plaque once, uh, Lord, make my words tender because I will most likely have to eat them. So, <laughs> I think the uh, story of St. Benedict is informative for us, or St. Ignatius is informative for us. So we're now in the, to the 16th century. Uh, he lived in the middle of the uh, 1500s. Um, and uh, and into the 1600s, uh, he was a, a courtier in the court of Spain, and he was uh, injured in a battle in Pamplona, and his leg was really uh, shattered, and they had to carry him back to home, to Loyola, and he uh, was laying in bed convalescing. I guess they broke his leg twice to try and fix it, and they say that the second time he had them break his leg is because he was not appreciative of the way it had healed. It had healed a jar. So his leg was, this leg was shorter than that leg, and it was very unbecoming. And he was not going to have, yeah, he was a, a dashing uh, courtier, and he was not going to have a broken up peg leg uh, ruin his chances for finding the maiden. You know, he was he was really looking after the princess of uh, Aragon or someplace there in Spain. So uh, he was not going to have it. So he underwent no without medication, right? He underwent a second breaking of his leg, and uh, and then they set it a second time. Eh, I guess it worked. Anyway, 
He's laying there in bed, and he loved to read the chivalrous novels, these stories about knights and maidens and battles and all that kind of stuff. And so he was uh, just devouring them, and he ran, got, ran out of them, didn't have anything else to read. And so his sister-in-law, in whose house he was staying, she handed him two books. One was The Life of Christ, uh, and the other one was A Book of the Saints. So there are two books. And uh, so he started reading this Life of Christ and the Saints, the story of the saints, and he began to be taken up with the stories of the saints in the same way that he was taken up with the stories of chivalry. Uh, his imagination, he would, get, uh, he would be lifted up, his spirits would be lifted up, he would forget his troubles, he would be transported, and all these things. And, uh, but he noticed a difference in reading the stories of Christ and the saints is that when he finished the stories of Christ and the saints, the lingering virtue and the desire to do the good and to consider the things that are noble and good and uh, virtuous, these feelings lingered in him. Unlike the chivalrous novels, when he would finish, you know how you get that, when, I don't know if you've been binging on any of these Netflix series like I do, you know, yeah, I really get attached to the characters and all that kind of stuff, and then we get to the last one, and I'm like, hmm. Nah, <laughs> story's over, I like that one. Yeah. I'm not going to find another one I like like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, about two hours later, I go, oh, yeah, there we go. Huh. <laughs> so I know how he feels, you know. So when you, you, he has all this intrigue, battles, and you know, trying to win the girl and all that kind of stuff, and the kingdoms and all that kind of stuff, and the back and forth, he was really engaged by that. But when he was done, it was down. So his desolation was immediate. And he immediately fell back into, oh, here I am with a broken leg and laying in bed. Not so when he read the lives of the saints. So what God was able to do by his wound, he used his wound. I think this is important for us in the spiritual life. God was able to use his wound to help him to reflect upon his natural powers and gifts, which was his fabulous, uh, obvious intellect, his imagination, his uh, call to, uh, to holiness, call to right life. And he was able, therefore, to take, well, he became converted in his life. So he wanted to serve, he wanted to become a knight of Our Lady, so the Blessed Virgin Mary. So he went uh, to Manresa or to Montserrat, one of those other places, and he uh, spent a year there in the monastery. You know, they all do the same thing. So if you haven't been called away for a year into the monastery, you're probably not on the way to you know, exalted sainthood. But anyway, this is how they did it. And he hung up his, uh, his battle sword at the shrine uh, in Manresa, and he gave his life to Christ, and he began to write what became the spiritual exercises. And it is what Father had showed us uh, maybe the first week of our gathering. It was the imaginative and graceful consideration of the stories of the life of Christ. From the Annunciation all the way to the Crucifixion. And by the use of our imagination and by the inclusion, by being taken up in this, we can be bowed up in our desolation with consolation from God and we can be inspired to grasp onto the virtues that God is offering all of us to accomplish these same things in our lives. Those spiritual exercises became the way that uh, uh, St. Ignatius then really transformed the world. So by the use of the imagination in prayer, uh, we can have our minds conformed to Christ and, and be empowered by that transformation to not only know God's will for us, but to do God's will in the world. So uh, we were... Um, Men for others. We are action and contemplation. So contemplation and action. So this was a revolution in uh, the world, in the spiritual life. There's a picture of him. I'm presuming is a, a good likeness. He has that large uh, Spanish nose, and he has the same hairdo that I'm working on. So, uh, and he was 40 years of age when this happened. So this is unusual, right? We usually think that. Uh, um, in this time, of course, most good things, important things happen by the age of 30. 
Uh, and so he was a late bloomer, and, uh, but he really he changed the world, and he changed the church. So um, that's, I've told you enough about the Ignatian thing. So in this illuminative phase of our Christian spirituality, if you will, there are other people in there. I have mentioned already Francis and Dominic and the Carmelites. Uh, there was uh, Teresa of Avila and John of the Cross. There was the great mystics of uh, the England, the 14th century, the cloud of unknowing and the Rhineland mystics, the 14th century and the 15th century, uh, the great scholastics, you know, Thomas Aquinas, the great saint. All of these people are in this period of time. So I don't mean to boil it down to Benedictinism and Ignatian spirituality. But what you can see is that this illuminating moment in the life of the church and in the spirituality of the church was the conviction that uh, the truth about God and the knowledge of God's will and uniting ourselves with God's will in the world and in our prayers is the uh, path to holiness. And it's available to everybody. We'll see in the later centuries, in the 17th century, with St. Francis de Sales and uh, then the more modern uh, uh, contemporary saints, uh, this is going to be especially... A bit, so you don't have to go and be a monk. You don't have to go and be a, a Carmelite sister. You don't have to go and be a, 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 Ignatia, a Jesuit priest in order to uh, know God, know God's will, and do God's will in the world, and to in, uh, know holiness in your life. Uh, that we're going to see in the, these latter centuries, in the last 500 years, is going to have been dispersed among all the baptized and all the faithful. So you don't have to leave home to find the kingdom of God, is uh, basically the mess. But in Benedictinism, these were the features of our spirituality, that we uh, saw, and now in this period of uh, the Middle Ages and, uh, and entering into the Renaissance, we have these scholarship and into the world. I told you that poverty, preaching, those the mendicants, experiential. This is the mysticism of the Rhinelands and the uh, uh, Teresa of Avila and uh, the Carmelites and apostolic action, Ignatius and method. You know, so this is a method of uh, reflecting on God's word and truth about God. So, virtue. If the task of the illuminative way is the habitual attachment to virtues, I figure, well, we better talk about what is a virtue and what are the virtues and what are some of those uh, pathways for us so a virtue is a habitual and firm disposition to do the good. That's the catechism of the Catholic Church. That's what three C's means always in uh, Catholic Church stuff. If you see three C's like that, that's the catechism of the Catholic Church. Once we acquire the habit, it becomes like a power in us. That's that virtus, the Latin word underneath virtue. is A virtue is a power. So it's not just an ideal. It's not just a goal. It's an actual grace and a power so that we can claim the virtue of courage. Okay? Uh, so moral habits pertain to man's ethical behavior. Moral habits that are good are called virtues. And moral habits that are bad are called vices. All right? So... You might want to put the vice word back down on the purgative stage. And, of course, that, uh, virtue is on the illuminative stage. We t traditionally categorize the virtues into three types. One is the theological virtues. You've heard this from St. Paul, right? In the first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 12 and to 13, is the faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these, in the end, the, only three things endure. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Those are called the theological virtues. Theological virtues, unlike uh, other virtues, are not things that we can acquire for ourselves or accomplish for ourselves. The reason they're called theological is because they are from God. You know that theos 
is the uh, word for God. So theological virtues are those things, faith, hope, and love, that are given from God, and they have as their object to accomplish in us God himself. So we have faith, hope, and love. Those are gifts from God, infused with sanctifying grace. They're infused, and their object is to draw us back to God. So they are power, for sure, because they're a virtue, but they are the theological virtues, and uh, they are from God and orient us to God. The cardinal virtues are these, of prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitude. And the moral virtues are typically oriented to those four categories. Right? So we have the capital virtues down here. Chastity, generosity, temperance, merciful love, meekness, and humility. What you may notice that just like the capital sins of gluttony and lust and uh, sloth, etc., these are accompanying seven virtues. So the church is trying to help us out here. God and the Holy Spirit is helping us out here. I know that these uh, sins can be a, a pain and a problem, but as I said, they can also be a pointer to us, and the church is helping us in the saying, all right, you're suffering with the problem of lust. Well, why don't you work on the virtue of chastity? Well, didn't know there was such a thing. I thought chastity was just a rule, right? You have to be chaste. Nobody told me it was a, a power, a power, so a gift from God. So let's take a look. Um, I told you about the, the theological virtues. So here's back to my charts. You know, I love my charts, right? And so we have the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. And we have the sins that go along with those three categories, those three temptations. And look here, perfectly opposing these uh, capital sins are the capital virtues. So the church in its wisdom, okay, so you see that. So sisters and brothers, now we have a plan. We have a program. We not even have a program. We have a help. We have grace. We have instruction. We have community. So now I am suffering from sin. I can identify where am I particularly being tempted, in what category, and how might I counteract these sins. Well, I could find out what does it mean to me to be diligent. If I'm slothful, what might it mean for me to be diligent? Well, I can investigate that. And then, so I would say, well, that means like you have to be more disciplined. You have to be more determined. So, well, how would I do that? Well, I'm going to make a schedule every day. And I'm going to set my alarm. And so I am not going to wait until 2 o'clock in the afternoon to take my bath. So um, that's the way uh, we can go about this methodically. So it's growth in the spiritual life in this help. This is very, very traditional Catholic spirituality and morality and the amendment of our lives, the adapting of our lives. And so don't be despairing about your sin but rather pick them up, take a look at them, find out where they're coming from, and then pick your poison here. Right? And, of course, the church, and you're getting that, you know, I've heard something about this before. Yes, like on Ash Wednesday and every Lent for the, your entire lives, why do we uh, go into fasting, prayer, fasting, and almsgiving? Well, because of this whole thing. So the, the Mass is holding up for us, the Church is holding up for us, the three traditional penances of Lent. Guess where they got them? All the way back here, Adam and Eve, temptations of Jesus in the desert, the capital sins that we all experience in these ways, and now we have the opposing virtues to help us out of the ditch. So we are not going to be like that person in the Bible who's um, jackass fell in the hole on the Sabbath and nobody's going to help him out. That's not the way it is. So when you fall in the hole, do not despair uh, for your church and your God loves you. What I've been saying throughout today is that we have our uh, threefold temptations. We have the three tasks of uh, the, the uh, spiritual life. And we see liberation from sin, the growth in the virtues, and resting in God. And now we even have a pathway through the virtues to get us to 
uh, this, the goal of our vocal, mental, and contemplative prayer. You can see here that I've divided up these uh, uh, segments of the history of Christian spirituality. Uh, they also coincide with these things. Sisters and brothers, this is going to help us out because I have given you uh, the list of moral virtues. So you have it on, there's three pages of that. I'm sorry that it got to be so long, and I know the print is small, but uh, so you can begin to study what the particular virtue that you need to grow in uh, as we uh, journey through the second step on spiritual life. Why don't you join me? This is a prayer of St. Ignatius of Loyola, and it is particularly apt to those of us in the illuminative uh, process of trying to grow in habitual uh, virtue, and you will see uh, St. Ignatius uh, prays through all of our enlightenment. So let's pray together. Take, Lord, receive all my liberty, my memory, my understanding, my entire will, all I have and call my own. You have given all to me. To you, Lord, I return it. Everything is yours. Do with it what you will. Give me only your love and your grace. That's enough for me. God bless you all. Thanks for your attention tonight. Let's take a moment to ask for the intercession of all those saints who came before us, guiding us along the way to Christ. So, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for the great gift of your saints. We ask that through their intercession, we would be led ever more deeply into the heart of your Son, that we would follow in their footsteps, in their way of walking, to learn more closely the way of walking of your Son. We ask all this in the power of your Spirit and in the name of your Son, Jesus, who is Lord forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So tonight we're going to be uh, praying with the Liturgy of the Hours, specifically night prayer, and then we're going to, in the context of night prayer, do what we call the examine, which is one of the prayer styles, the models of prayer, that uh, St. Ignatius of Loyola gave us. So um, we're going to, I know we've kind of been hitting Ignatius pretty hard tonight, uh, but it is, uh, he was a, and is a great example for us, so um, he is a good place for all of us to start. So let's talk briefly about what the Liturgy of the Hours is and uh, what it does for the church. So if you don't know, the Liturgy of the Hours is the five times every day that all priests, religious, and deacons are bound to pray. We have made promises to pray them. And in addition to us, many lay people pray the Liturgy of the Hours as well. And so these take place at specific times throughout the day if you're doing it the way you're supposed to be doing it. And, these, uh, and this um, then includes different things like all of them include psalms, all of them include uh, readings, different lengths of readings depending on the time. The office of readings includes uh, some wisdom from the church, often uh, writings of the saints or from a council during the history of the church. And the point of this is that it's really modeled after the Jewish way of praying. During, in the Jewish and Hebrew tradition, they would pray five times a day using the Psalms, the book of the Psalms, and they would uh, gather together as a community, they would sing the Psalms, they would meditate on the Word of God, and they would uh, do this same thing that we're doing. And so the reason that it's called the Liturgy of the Hours is because liturgy, which means work of the people, right, the people of God working together for the sanctification of the whole world for ourselves, the church, and for the rest of the world. And so the Liturgy of the Hours is directional. It's pointed outwards, although it is often done by 
priests and uh, deacons uh, by themselves. It is directionally pointed towards the good of the whole world. And so we do this prayer in communion with every other person who is doing this prayer every day. And we offer this prayer for the sanctification of the whole world. And so participation in the Liturgy of the Hours is a great way for us to really align ourselves with what Mother Church is thinking. If you think about this, if you think sometimes that uh, Father Estock and myself and Father Michael, or if you go to one place and you hear a similar homily or something like that, or you hear a similar reflection on something, chances are that we all of us got it from the same place, the Liturgy of the Hours. This is a way for the whole church, every person, every priest, and then all of the people that the priests interact with, all of the deacons and all the people the deacons interact with, all the religious and the same thing, on and on, right? So Mother Church gives us all something to pray with, and then it conforms all of our minds, right, to conform our mind to Christ through the renewal of our mind. Uh, and then to uh, then all of us are thinking the same way. We're thinking like Christ. And then we can take that out into the world. And so the purpose of the Liturgy of the Hours is to help us to conform our minds to Christ. So it is really properly part of this illuminative way where we're working towards virtue, and now, in conjunction with that, during the uh, night prayer portion, so the last portion of every day, we pray night prayer. And during night prayer, there is a specific portion where we're called to do an examination of conscience at the end of our day. And so you can do it in many different ways. It is written into uh, the formal way and the way that it's written into the Liturgy of the Hours is to do one of the options of the penitential act from the Mass, right? You do the same thing that you do during Mass at the end of your day where we call to mind our sins and we reflect on the, what we've done and then we ask God for his mercy. In addition to that, often people will incorporate the examine. And the examine is a series of... of these steps, depending on which version you're doing, sometimes it's five, sometimes it's seven, but it's they are all very similar. It just depends on how much you break them down. And so the examine is designed to be done at the same time every day so that you look at the last 24 hours of your day and you can decide where grace has shown up in your life. You can discern where you need to move uh, to receive more grace, so where you've been struggling. And you thank God for the good things that he's done, and you ask him to help you in the future. And so that's the basic structure. And so uh, when we come to the end of our day and we do this every single day for, this, for a significant amount of time, it actually shows us the patterns of grace and the patterns of sin in our life. This is the main purpose of the examine. Because just as we've been talking about with Father Astok for the last uh, hour or so, right? we've been thinking about where are the sins in our life and how can they point us towards the grace this is the purpose of the illuminative way. This is what we're doing. When we're in the illuminative way, we're moving from the sin that we left behind in the purgative way, and we're moving towards the virtue. And so think about this. How many times, right, has Father Estock said it, how many times have we come to confession and we've said the same sins over and over again? And then we're trying to figure out, well, why do I have the same sins over and over and over again? Well, if you want to know why you have the same sins over and over again, you have to look at what you're doing all the time. It is the situations that we allow ourselves to be in. It is the triggers that we allow to set us off. It's the things that are not healed in our hearts. Those things show up when we examine our life every day. And so when we do the examine, it reveals to us, oh my gosh, every time that that person says something in this way, it just like sets me off. 
Every time that I get into this situation, I get so anxious. And then that anxiety causes me to overeat because I'm worried about something. Every time that I get into this kind of conversation with someone, it makes me so sad. And then I can't handle that sadness. And so then I go and I look at something that I shouldn't, that causes me to be led into sin. Or I get caught up in Netflix or whatever it is, right? Because when we really stop and think about it every single day, those patterns begin to like pop out and really show us what's going on in our hearts. And so that's how we identify the grace that we need to be going after. If we can see where the wound is, like Ignatius, right? If we can see where the wound is and what needs to be done to heal it the way that it should be healed, although he did it for vain reasons in the beginning, it's still a good example, right? He shows us what we're supposed to be oriented towards. And so we can do that by looking at the pattern of our life every single day, identifying where the grace was, where the struggle was, thanking God for the goodness, asking him for the grace to move out of that sin. Then it gives us this pattern of our life, okay? So when we do that, in the context of the Liturgy of the Hours, right, we're praying with all of the church, We're conforming our minds and our hearts to what the church as a whole is doing. And then we're conforming our, we're seeing where we could do better. And we're thanking God for the good things that he has done in our lives. All of the liturgy of the hours consists at least of one, often more than one psalm. The Psalms are such an important part of our tradition. And Jesus himself, of course, prayed many of the Psalms throughout the Gospels, right? He's using the Psalms. Maybe you don't recognize them, but oftentimes he'll slip them in without you realizing it. Many people don't know that the last word, one of some of the last words that he said at the end of his life, right, when he's Let's choose one feature of our day. I know we've been going over a lot of them. And we want to pray into that, meaning we want to specifically uh, plan how to continue doing that tomorrow if it was a good thing, or how to avoid doing that tomorrow if it was a difficult thing. Actually make a plan. not just saying, well, I'll try better. I'll try harder. Now we're going to take a moment just to pray for all those who are in need in our lives. So we're going to Just take a moment to call to mind those people and offer them to the Lord. When we do the examine uh, as a standalone prayer, you will, you, it's a good idea to end it with an Our Father. But when we do it in the context of night prayer like this, we simply continue to pray in the, uh, with the prayers of the church. So uh, now grab your pamphlet. And again, I'll do the antiphon at the beginning, and we'll all say it together at the end. Have mercy, Lord, and hear my prayer. When I call, answer me, O God of justice. From anguish you released me. Have mercy and hear me. O men, our God, when we are closed, will you not order to heal and seek one It is the Lord who grants favors to those whom he loves. The Lord hears me whenever I call him. Fear the enemy, do not sin. Conquer your bed and do so. Make justice your sacrifice and trust in the Lord. 
What can bring us happiness, many say. Let the light of your face shine on us, O Lord. I lie down in peace, and sleep comes at once. For you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Together, have mercy, Lord, and hear my prayer. In the silent hours of night, bless the Lord. O come, bless the Lord, all you who serve the Lord, who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Lord bless from Zion, he who made both heaven and earth. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. In the silent hours of night, bless the Lord. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Therefore, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Take to heart these words which I enjoin on you today. Drill them into your children Speak of them at home and abroad, whether you are busy or at rest. Into your hands, Lord, I commend my spirit. Into Into your your hands, hands, Lord, Lord, I commend my my spirit. spirit. You have redeemed us, Lord God of truth. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Protect us, Lord, as we stay awake. Watch over us as we sleep, that awake we may keep watch with Christ and asleep rest in his peace. Lord, now you let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. A light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people, Israel. As it was, beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Protect us, Lord, as we stay awake. Watch over us as we sleep, that awake we may keep watch with Christ, and asleep rest in his peace. Let us pray. Lord, we beg you to visit this house and banish from it all the deadly power of the enemy. May your holy angels dwell here to keep us in peace. And may your blessings be upon us always. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Go in peace. Let us pray together the Hail Holy Queen, or Hail Queen of Heaven. Hail Queen of Heaven, beyond compare to whom the angels homage pay. Hail, root of Jesse, gate of light, that opened the world's new day. Rejoice, O virgin unsurpassed, in whom our ransom has begun. For all your loving children pray, to Christ our Savior and your Son. Amen. Thank you all for joining us tonight. We will be back next week with the last session, the third on this journey of the purgative, unit, or purgative illuminative, and unitive. Uh, so we'll be jumping into the most interesting, I find, because let's be honest, our sins really aren't that unique or interesting. But the uh, unitive stage of the, prayer, of the journey is the most interesting to me. So we'll see you all next week. God bless.